Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii, coming to you from breezy, shady, back of Manoa Valley. Welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us in an exciting show. We have Sarah Bauer, who, among other things, was a teacher at Main Street Scholars. She will be going on for her advanced degrees per next year or so, is just about to graduate from UH in Global Environmental Sciences, which I didn't even know existed. I suspect most people in the audience didn't know existed. Fairly recent discipline and one that is really, really sorely needed. I think we can all agree on that. So welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, Thank Sarah and Carbon Tech. You have a, a really unique perspective on this based on your UH education, I think, of looking not at individual behavior, not at the micro level, but much more at the macro level and policy. How in the world, what does policy sound so gosh darn boring? What does policy have to do with ameliorating climate change and carbon tax? Please take it away, Sarah, and welcome. Thank you so much for introducing me. Um, yeah, so I'm graduating from UH Manoa this Saturday with the, my degree in Bachelor's of Science in Global Environmental Science. Uh, so I've been spending the past four years learning about uh, planetary sciences, um, uh, the science of climate change and whatnot. And yes, there has a lot to do with policy, at least in our ability to affect climate change. So while I wish, you know, it was something that I could change on an individual level or you could change on an individual level. It's gonna require a lot more work than that and it's gonna require policy. So essentially policy is going to let us address climate change at a structural level. And I do realize that policy a lot of times has more of a dry connotation. People usually just think politics and corruption and whatnot. But there's a lot we can do in order to attack climate change by changing our policies. And currently, um, there's been a lot of lobbying from oil and gas industries. So they have kind of been able to lead the direction in which our climate policy has gone and ensuring that they get the subsidies and that oil prices and whatnot are always kept low. Um, so... The main thing that I want to talk about today is uh, using carbon pricing mechanisms in order to reduce our carbon emissions. So a carbon pricing mechanism is something where we put a price on carbon. Um, in California, they have a cap and trade system. Throughout the UN, we have there's a carbon tax. Um, and one of the first uh, places where a carbon tax was introduced was actually in Sweden, where my mom is from. And they introduced it back in 1991, I believe. And by the 2000s, they already had like a 20% reduction in carbon emissions. Now it's much more. And at the same time, they had um, an increase in GDP growth. Um, so the thing that I'm most excited about is if we're able to introduce a carbon fee and dividend. The first thing um, I'd want to talk about is uh, a little bit of background. So to start, in, if you imagine uh, a graph that shows how our carbon emissions have been increasing since the 1900s, it's pretty exponential. It just goes mm -hmm. straight up like that. Um, and currently, we are producing about 50 billion tons of uh, CO2 emissions at an annual rate. Um, so we're really putting out a lot of greenhouse gases. And the effect that this has on the planet is that um, it traps in more heat, and thus we see this temperature increase, and we have all of the climate change um, problems that are associated with that. So in Hawaii, we're going to see a lot of problems, including sea level rise, increase in hurricanes. Across the world, we're going to see drought, and we already are seeing that drought, as well as the increase in fires and whatnot. So 
a lot of people are going to be losing their home from all of these climactic uh, disasters. So something needs to change. And, we and Sarah, Sarah, let me jump in and say a lot of people are going to say, wait a minute, we're talking a worldwide problem. Hawaii has only 1.4 million people, which is 0.04% of the entire US population. We're just this teeny, teeny little speck in the middle of the ocean. What difference could we, teeny Hawaii, possibly make the answer? And this comes from decades of experience on my part, is that people look to Hawaii for leadership. We go to national conferences and we get respect. People come around, they talk to us, they invite us to speak and so forth. So our power is way, way exponentially beyond our, our teeny little uh, population. So on that, Cherry Hill, please uh, proceed. Thank you, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, I think in 2018 it was, we were the very first state that announced that we would get to net zero emissions um, or to fully mm -hmm. renewable. Um, by 2045. And since then, we've seen state after state after state after state follow in that trend and also announce that they're going to reduce emissions um, and try and get to a point where they're net zero by 2045. So perfect, perfect example. Usually California leads the way. Mm -mm. Little old Hawaii led the way in, in that regard. That's the perfect example. Thank you. But one thing you were really um, uh, correct about um, is that, right, Hawaii is a very small population. And a lot of times we even look at individual action when it comes to climate change. And that's something that was actually an idea propagated by a lot of these oil and gas companies. BP actually introduced the concept of an individual carbon footprint and came out with one of the first carbon footprint calculators, if you've ever heard of that or maybe looked at your own carbon footprint. Um, so. A lot of times these companies are trying to show that, oh, it's individual action that needs to change. And I am a huge proponent, proponent of changing your own actions to help the climate, right? So yes, we still should you know, reduce our meat intake and you should use a reusable water bottle and you should bring your own bag to the store, but you are a teeny tiny fraction because it is 15 billion tons a year. The Americans, right, in the United States, we have a really big carbon footprint in comparison to a lot of impoverished or developing nations. So our carbon footprint is massive, but still it's about 16 tons per person. That is 0.000. .000 zero 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 three percent of the total global emissions we are just a rounding error we're a teeny tiny percent that it was mm. not zeros and then a three so even if you do go vegan and you go to um complete zero waste lifestyle and you never drive a car again and you never get on a plane again your impact is negligible right so still do those things because like with the Hawaii example, you do change the actions of others, right? And we have much more vegan products in stores. It's, you know, pretty normal now to see everyone with a reusable water bottle and a reusable bag. And that is awesome. But that is not how we're going to solve climate change. Right. Um, uh, just this last century, just a few decades ago, we were having a huge problem with CS. CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons that were getting released into the atmosphere and totaling our ozone, right? We have, we're just creating this large hole in the ozone. And that was from the release of these CFCs. And we were able to change that we're using policy. And we passed the Montreal Protocol and all of these countries agreed to stop releasing CFCs. But that required government changes that required structural changes and it was amazing and it took it was really amazing because it was fast we got all these governments together but that was because the ozone is something that was decreasing at such a fast rate we were going to see the impacts almost immediately um climate change we're seeing the impact slowly and we're seeing the impacts first on impoverished and developing nations. And we see it less of a, as a threat to us. So we've been stalling our attack on climate change. And it's especially hard when 
we have these companies that have had so much money for so long so that they can influence our politics by lobbying and making sure that they keep their subsidies and by increasing um, kind of uh, confusion about whether climate change is real. It is. And the vast majority of people believe climate change is real because it is. It's just that we have some deniers and they're very, very loud. And these people who are loud are really good at causing confusion or trying to stir up debate when it comes to getting policy or things passed. But it's time that we start changing that and we start having policy that is going to help reduce our carbon emissions. Um, so the best route for us to do that is by introducing a tax and reducing the negative externality that are carbon emissions. Um, and what is a negative externality? It is something um, that we have uh, essentially an unaccounted for negative effect. So when we have carbon emissions, it's not just the price that you know the oil company had to go get the oil um, and then they sell it to the consumer because that's not the full impact of the oil. It's not just, oh, it was really expensive to get this stuff out. No, it's we're releasing it into the atmosphere and it's causing air pollution, which is causing health problems for people. It is causing um, global changes. Um, so our uh, climate is changing, our weather is changing, uh, and we're gonna see really bad effects pretty soon. Uh, so we need something to change that. Uh, the International Monetary Fund is a big proponent of introducing a carbon tax or a carbon fee and dividend, just like the one um, in Sweden, because it's one of the most powerful and efficient tools that we have. Um, so they think that the all the biggest carbon um, polluters and emitters in the world need to introduce a carbon tax in order to reduce our emissions so that we keep our warming to two degrees or less. All right, so now we, I should probably tell you what is a carbon fee and dividend? Because have you heard of a carbon tax before? What's we, your... we have, Sarah, why don't you start with carbon tax and then say that's that, because that, that's something we're familiar with. And then say, uh, as opposed to that, here's what a carbon fee is all about. All right, so a carbon tax um, is pretty straightforward. Uh, we put a price on carbon, essentially. So per ton of carbon that gets released, we're going to say it's going to cost $10, $15, however much we want it to be. And you can have a tax, and a tax is usually something you put a tax and the government collects and keeps the money. So you could put a tax on um, carbon emissions, and we can try and put that as high up as possible. So we try and put it, take it to the mines, we take it to the you know natural gas uh, people, and that's where the tax goes. And then the U.S. government collects the money, and if they collect the money, maybe that would go towards uh, renewable investment or somewhere else. Um, a carbon fee and dividend is also, it's also referred to as a carbon cashback system. And the reason they call it a fee instead of a tax is because the government is no longer just keeping the money now. The money is going back to the people. And the reason it's important that the money goes back to people is when you have a carbon tax, and right, as I said, we're trying to put it up as high as possible, so it's not on the consumer, but it inevitably ends up on the consumer because the price goes up a little bit for all your carbon intensive products. So your electricity bill, your um, the price at the pump, but it's pretty minimal impact um, on people, especially higher incomes, but lower incomes, it, they're gonna see, you know, this is a larger effect and they're not going to have the same ability to change for just a carbon tax. Um, so Sarah, let me interrupt again. You say we're going to raise it, put the tax at, at as high a level as possible. I assume that you mean you are will be taxing the corporations rather than the the individuals. Yes, thank you. Thanks for making that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, ca carbon is produced from coal, oil, and uh, nat natural gas. All of those are hydrocarbons. And that's where the CO two is coming from. Yes, exactly. The, the burning of these fossil fuel resources is what 
emits carbon dioxide as well as other um, greenhouse gases. So um, the oil companies, right, they get the tax and they now want to, um, they are losing a little bit of money from the tax. So they want to put some of that onto the consumer. So if we return all the money that we collected as taxes and give it back to the people, now people aren't worse off, but the overall price for our electricity bill, if it's reliant on natural gas, if it's reliant on um, other electricity that is not renewable, it is going to be more expensive. But switching to things that are more renewable or less carbon intensive are going to be less um, expensive. So it is renewables and anything else that's not carbon intensive, more cost competitive. So it helps to bring um, more uh, renewable energy on board and it helps uh, companies make that decision to change to renewable energies. So a little bit more context. So for the exact carbon fee and dividend um, that the group I work with, Citizens Climate Lobby, um, are advocating for is a carbon fee and dividend, A. So revenue from the tax is returned to the people. It also, B, is one where it starts low, where it's a, a smaller tax, maybe say $15, um, you know, and then we increase it by $10 every year. Then this creates um, something that's stable and predictable on the prices of oil, gas, fossil fuels, and whatnot. Um, there's some uh, other techniques where if you had a, you know, a cap and trade system, you're essentially creating a, a carbon market and it can be really confusing because you have no idea what the price is gonna be. This is something that's very stable and you know it's just going to increase over time. So it gives um, companies, it gives people the time to kind of adjust uh, and to understand that these carbon intensive products are just going to get more and more expensive. So companies and you, utilities and people can start thinking ahead and saying, if I get solar panels now, if I get an electric vehicle now, if I do you know, switch to anything that's less carbon intensive, I'm going to save a lot of money in the long term because I know that next year it's going to be ten dollars more, and the next year it's going to be twenty, and so on. Um, the last thing that they're also advocating for within this carbon fee and dividend is a, a border tax uh, or a border adjustment. Um, so a border adjustment ensures that uh, the U.S. isn't worse off, and that companies don't try to leave the U.S. to do any of their carbon intensive. Um, whatnot in other countries where they're not going to be taxed. Um, but having a border carbon adjustment essentially means that um, if you're importing goods from another country into the U.S. and there is no carbon tax, it's going to have a carbon tax placed on it. Um, and that's something the U.S. is about to face with the um, EU, where they're going to have a border carbon or, or a border adjustment for a carbon tax because they have a carbon tax and we don't thereby our products are going to get more expensive in Europe because we don't have a carbon tax on our products. Uh, Sarah, can you explain, I'm not clear, the, the tax goes not to the government, but it comes back to the individual. Can you explain how, how that's going to work. I mean, it's mainly the corporations who are being taxed, and I'm gathering it's the individuals who do not use as much fossil fuel as they're the ones who are going to benefit, or how, how, how does that work? Yeah. So the way it works um, with dividends is you can give it back to every person um, on a monthly basis, and we give it back equally. So um, we try to make this revenue neutral, and then no matter if you're low income, middle income, high income, you're getting the money back. So I'm going to really simplify this because yeah, yeah. <laughs> fossil fuels out of the equation, right? Let's say we have um, three people, a high income person, a middle income person, and a low income person. And they're essentially, they all have a carbon kind of um, consumption budget, right? So if you're, you're high income, you're spending more on your electricity bill for your big house. Um, 
maybe you're driving more, but also just higher income people end up spending a lot, uh, a lot more money on products. And that even uh, contributes to uh, the amount of either your carbon footprint, essentially. So high uh, income households, essentially, they have a higher carbon footprint. Middle income people have a um, mid medium, essentially just lower carbon uh, footprint than someone high income and low income people have significantly uh, smaller of a carbon footprint. So say we have these three people in these three different income categories, and they're going to have to contribute to this pool of money. And so the high income person, let's say they contribute five dollars. Um, that, that was their essentially what they're spent on carbon in a month. The middle income person, they ended up spending three dollars. And so they contributed three dollars of carbon intensive whatnot. And the low income person, they, you know, they didn't spend that much on products, whatnot. They have a much lower carbon uh, consumption for that month. So they contribute $1. Now we have $9 in our pool of money from these three people. We're gonna split it up evenly. So nine divided by three, we have $3. Each person gets $3 back. So this means that the middle income person, they ended up just the same. The low income person ended up gaining $2 and the high income person ended up losing $2. So carb if carbon fee and dividend isn't this simple, but it means that people who are, have a really carbon intensive diet, like a high income person, they're essentially contributing more um, money to this because of all the products that they buy that are carbon intensive. <laughs> Then the middle income person, they don't do as much. Usually the dividends that they get back, they're kind of gonna even out and the low income person, they're gonna end up better off. So essentially we bring all this money in from the tax and we return it evenly as dividends. And this can um, be done by the you know, tax systems that we already have in place with the IRS. And um, a good example was you know, the CARES Act and all the COVID stimulus money that was sent back to people. So it would be sent back to households on a, a monthly basis. And all the studies have shown that most of the time, or, or essentially low and middle income people are going to end up the same or better off. Um, and then high income people might end up a little worse off. And that makes sense when, if you're really rich, you're contributing more to the pollution of the planet. Um, so then you have to pay a little bit more. It's kind of like if you have, um, trash that to take out right you pay a fee for your trash to get picked up you're really rich you buy a lot of things you throw a lot of things out you have a lot more trash to get picked up so your fee should be a little bit higher since you know it's a lot more a lot more stuff to pick up yeah sarah what comes to mind is the uh, super rich where they might have a home on maui and another one in france and another one in fiji and they've got a jet to jet themselves around. And when they get bored, they've got a yacht to cruise around on. That yep. sounds like a heck of a lot of carbon consumption to me. It sure does. Sounds the same to me. Yeah, so they end up having, uh, they end up having a much larger mm -hmm. carbon diet, right? Um, so they're going to end up paying for more of it. And this way, um, a carbon fee and dividend is really progressive, and it can actually help low and middle income families. In, the, in Hawaii, actually, we were really close to getting something passed, or maybe not really close, is maybe a bit optimistic, um, but it ended up dying in committee. But um, it was called er, a carbon cashback, and it was HB 2278. Um, and it was going to be a carbon fee and dividend system and it had been advocated for by citizens climate lobby as well as a lot of other environmental groups um and it partly got so far as it did because university of hawaii you hero um university of hawaii economic research organization they have done some studies on this as well as lots and lots of other economists um uh, and they were showing that right a it's progressive, but in Hawaii in particular, people would end up even better off because we have so many visitors. We have uh, so many tourists coming in. So they would be kind of providing to this pool of money and then it would be given back in revenues only to the households that live in Hawaii. So in Hawaii, it would be, you know, especially good for the people that live here because um, you'd be getting the money back, not just for everyone living in Hawaii, but everyone who's coming to Hawaii and right, 
um, impacting our environment and buying all of these carbon intensive things. So. Yeah, I think we've been called something like an airline economy. Yeah. Because again, we have this small little population and Honolulu Airport is one of the busier airports in the world. And then you combine that with all the neighbor island airports. Uh, I was recently in uh, Maui Airport, first time in a couple of years, and it just keeps expanding, expanding, expanding. Air yeah. Jet fuel is a major part of our uh, economy. Yeah, it sure is. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, the You Hero study just goes to show, especially for a lot of low-income countries, how a carbon fee and dividend can be a really good system because if you have all of these other visitors coming and contributing to that tax, they're going to get a lot more money back. So mm -hmm. um, places with really high tourism are going to benefit a lot. Um, this would change you know, if you were a, a, able to pass a you know, national carbon fee and dividend, which is mm -hmm. you know, kind of the ideal, uh, because it would really, really help to bring down our emissions um, and help the uh, U.S. as an overall bring down our or help lower middle income and bring down emissions and kind of just show to the world um, our commitment to climate change, because, you know, right now we're not we're really not fulfilling what we've said we were going to do. Um, um, and we've got to close, but let me close on a, a cheerier, lar larger note. Namely, that much of the social unrest that we are experiencing in this country is due to increasing income inequality. The rich are getting much richer, the super rich are getting much, much, much richer. The lower 50% of our economic earners are either stagnant or even growing backwards. And that is causing a heck of a lot of anger, a heck of a lot of frustration. So that, that's a story that goes under all of this unrest that we're experiencing. So you are a good part, you're, you're proposing a major part of the uh, solution here. And on that cheery note of, I'm afraid, Sarah, that we must bid fond adieu. Thank you so much for your innovative uh, ideas and participating in a very, very, very uh, worthy cause. And wish you all the best. Your career is just now starting, and I'm sure you'll be back at the legislature next session with probably a stronger group of allies to uh, lo lobby for this. So thank you so much, Sarah Bauer. Thank you so Non-carbon tax, yes, yes, great having you. And all you listeners, see you next time. Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.